Well, so for the last lesson today, it's led by Vita Wills. Vita runs the Culture of Repair Project out of California, USA. Coming from a background of organising community repair events, Vita has, over recent years, dived deep into the question of how to embed repair in an educational settings such as schools. For this final session, Vita has invited a wide range of speakers who are pioneering different project approaches to teaching repair in both formal and educational settings and beyond. Vita, over to you. Okay. Um, <laughs> good morning, coming from California. Um, and it's good afternoon some places and good evening other places. Um, so welcome to this session on education and um, repair. And we're focused principally on the uh, K through 12 um, uh, levels. And I guess everybody's um, here. So I'm super excited. We have some great presenters um, and some incredible programs that they're going to speak about. Um, we have, so this is a session that's really geared to uh, educators or to uh, repair in the, um, in an educational setting. And, um, and I want to just say that the number one um, hope for this session, and, and really my aspiration is that, and I'm gonna read this so I get it exactly the way that I um, mean to say it, it <clears throat> excuse me, is that through these discussions and through this question answer, we're gonna broaden our vision of how repairing objects can be gateways for learning. So that's really what it turns around. All these programs are looking at repairing objects and then by way of that repair, opening up um, possibilities in learning. So I'm super excited to, um, to explore that uh, with them and with you. Um, so we're gonna hear from these four programs and in those you're gonna um, see the range of objectives and processes and formats and, um, and settings that where we can see this, um, this uh, uh, phenomenon of repairing objects um, and being a, a different ways that people um, uh, deploy that uh, in educational settings. And then we're gonna hear from a, um, a scholar researching um, repair in education in educational settings. Um, and so then um, that will be sort of the, 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 the meat and potatoes that then is explored by way of our um, question and uh, answer session. And then our, our second hope is that, and I think this is inevitable, there's gonna be some momentum coming out of this session, some real excitement about what are the possibilities um, of repair in uh, education. And then um, we'll uh, couple that with uh, helping you understand or know about some various resources for actually um, creating programs and, and then exploring how repair can work in your various settings. Um, and then, um, let's see, so then after, the, so after the presentations, as I mentioned, um, we're going to take the questions and answers um, and explore um, what your specific um, take is. And then I wanna just mention that, um, so in the chat, there's, we're gonna ask you to do two things. One is put your questions, and the other is that we're going to um, put a link to the website, um, Cultural Repair website, where we have, uh, I have a lot of information about who the presenters are, links to their various programs, um, access to different resources, the things that have been published, um, and a link to the forum on the Restart Project. We think that this forum, uh, we have an area for educators, and it'll be a um, great place where people can continue the conversation, exchange resources, and so on and so forth. Um, so with that uh, introduction, um, I'm gonna turn to our first presenters um, who are Bonnie Baruki and, uh, and Linda Curry, Transition Berkeley, coming from Berkeley, California. They've um, organized a terrific program for high schoolers called Essential Repair Skills Training. It's a 12-week program meeting once a week 
um, for repair skills. And so I will turn it over to, I see Linda and there's Bonnie, great. So please. Hi, thanks, thanks Vita for inviting us to present today and hello to everybody from California. Um, I'm Linda Curry and Bonnie Baruki and I are the co-directors of Transition Berkeley. And we're, well, we're right across the bay from San Francisco, that's where we're located. We are part of the uh, transition network in the US. Um, as you probably, you might know, there's groups in Europe and actually across the world. The transition movement is about communities stepping up to address the really big challenges um, that we all face by starting locally and uh, by coming together, um, we, we feel that we're able to create solutions together. Okay, um, this is Bonnie. In Bringing Neighbors Together, we host a number of community building activities throughout the year. The Crop Swap and Share is one example of our longtime community events, drawing 15 to 40 people each week. Next slide, please. Well, one of our most successful events has been our community repair cafes. Um, in 2018, we met Vita Wells, our host here today, and um, Peter Mui, founder of the Fix It Clinic, and they connected us with this incredible community of repair experts in um, locally. So the same year, we hosted our first repair cafe in a local church with help from Vita and the culture of repair. The event was so successful, we applied for grants and organized a number of repair cafes in 2019. Here's a picture from one of those events where fix them with the help of 30 repair coaches and 15 volunteers. We went on to host several more um, large and su successful events that year. Next slide. So um, here we are in, in 2021, 22. So what we noticed from the repair cafes was there were a lot of old, older, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in that category older uh, repair volunteers and we weren't finding that there were any younger people helping out and um, it you know repair skills just aren't being encouraged or taught in schools anymore so we decided that we would create a repair training class for young people aiming at high school age so here you see in this picture um, this was our virtual repair training we had intended to do it live, but then COVID came. And um, so we developed, uh, working with two University of California engineering students, our community repair volunteers and nonprofits, we created this um, 12 session repair skills training class for high school students, which we did online because of COVID. And surprisingly, students showed up on Friday afternoon and they seemed to really get something out of it. Um, it was very difficult teaching this class online, but overall, um, we got great feedback and uh, nearly all the students, I think there were about 12, so that they would try to repair things on their own in the future and would love to take the class if offered again. So then in um, the following year, building on, on what we learned from the online version, we offered the repair training again from February to May 2022. And this time it was in person on the school campus. So these are some of the logistics of the class. It was held at Berkeley Technology Academy. That's a public alternative school campus. It was a standalone class um, for academic credit. About 12 students, grades eight through 12, attended this 12 week class held Fridays, two to 3.30 PM in the independent studies science classroom. The objectives of the class are, as you can see here, um, students learned repair skills helpful in their daily lives, thus making repair a possibility rather than throwing things away. And um, let's see about, yeah, we teamed up with our community of repair experts and local organizations to teach repair skills, including clothing, bicycles, electronics, and appliances. So our, our goals were really, you know, just starting with basic problem solving skills, 
We also wanted to include the bigger picture, things like ecology, waste stream, circular economy, repair and repair concepts. And we especially want to focus on the hands on learning uh, about diagnosis and repair and um, be, and having the students be able to perform simple repairs on on their everyday items. We also wanted to teach uh, how existing products are made and analyze how they could be better designed and constructed. And then at the end and throughout and at the end of the class, we talked a lot about internships, um, education, job and career opportunities in fields of repair, but also things like the trades. So the program um, was uh, designed by um, Bonnie and myself um, as part of Transition Berkeley, along with the two UC Berkeley students for the first class anyway. And then we incorporated um, our community repair volunteers that we had gotten from the repair cafe work to join us. And the, the class was supported by the school administrator and, and three teachers in the school and facilitated completely by Bonnie and myself. Um, the classes were actually taught by the community repair volunteers and staff from the local nonprofit groups. And the, the, this project was funded by the Chancellor's Community Partnership Funds, Stop Waste, and the Altamont Education Advisory Board. So, now, um, now we're going to give you sort of a brief snapshot of the repair classes themselves. The first class shown here was to help the students to understand really what the problems were are with waste. So we have the ecology center staff on the right, talking about waste and recycling from a local standpoint, but also big picture. And then Peter Mui, uh, which many of you may know from fix it clinic came in and talked about repair skills being um, potentially a superpower that the kids could all be all have um, as part of the solution. So here you can see our sewing class. Um, this is our repair coach CC Clark on the left. Uh, we met with our repair coaches prior to each class um, to go over the tools and supplies and activities for each class. These two classes covered basic hand sewing and they also got to use a sewing machine in the second class and learn about sewing machines. But besides teaching these essential skills, we also discussed the problems of fast fashion causes um, of with waste piling up and other countries having to deal with a lot of our waste and fabrics. So the class, the classes on bike repair that you see in the pictures here were taught by coaches from two nonprofits, the Alameda County Bike Mobile and Waterside Workshop. Um, the uh, Waterside also offers internships. Um, the classes covered how to use tools, fix flat tires, adjust brakes, maintain chains, and more. And we also talked about biking being a cheap and clean. Uh, clean transportation versus driving a car. I think our gas prices are around $6 a gallon now. So the kids could re relate to that. <laughs> okay, we also taught electronic repair, computer repair. Students learned how to use their iFixit kits, um, online resources, how to disassemble and reassemble the lap laptops and phones. Here they're working with MacBooks um, and identify parts of the devices. We also delved into the problems with e-waste, um, all the mineral extraction and other, like we saw before, how um, a lot of the waste goes to other countries, and um, right to repair legislation. We talked about that. This is the uh, photos from the lamp repair class where we covered um, just the real basics of electricity how to use a multimeter, um, uh, covered the parts of the lamp and common things that can go wrong. And they were actually rewiring and fixing lamps here. Um, we also covered energy efficient light bulbs. So one of the most fun classes where, was where students brought their own things to repair. So we have some students here um, repairing an iPad, 
um, a go-kart engine, um, let's say a game console, and they brought several other things. So they, they learned diagnostic skills to look at the problem and investigative skills to find solutions. What you see in this picture um, was uh, a walking field trip from the school to our local tool lending and teen library. The staff um, showed the resources available at the library, the tools that can be borrowed, and the various support that the library has for teens. Uh, what's interesting is most students didn't even know the library has existed and it's been around for 40 years or more and they hadn't been to a library most of them since about middle school so it was a fun class so this is in a final class um, not everybody was in the picture what um, stuck around for the picture but in, anyways we um we discussed the next steps and which that was could be internships jobs and careers other educational opportunities and our local repair resources. The students completed the class requirements, took an end of the class survey, and received the certificate of completion. So the main accomplishments were um, achieved in that every student gained knowledge of repair um, and actual hands on repair skills. We um, had surveys both at the start of class, end of class, and when asked at the end of the class, what steps do you think you'll take after this class? 90% of the students said, I will take what I learned so far and try to fix things on my own. Students also gained a greater understanding of the environment and why impair, repair is really an important component in conserving valuable resources, solving problems um, that are caused by waste. The challenges, um, we're just hosting the class during COVID. Uh, we, we had to practice safe protocols and could, really couldn't have more than about 12 students. And um, in working with the school, you know, getting the administration on board and the teacher support, actually scheduling when the class would happen, it was a standalone, and finding classroom space were some of the things. Um. So we had, like I said, we had 12 students and three teachers helping out. And um, we also we had, these are a few quotes from some of the students and teachers. And Corey, he was one of our 12th grade students, said, I would absolutely recommend this class to anybody. It was the most fun and engaging class I've ever taken. And useful because we got to fix things in class and learn so many things, literally all the repair skills. Teachers and coaches were wonderful and helpful. And one of our teachers, Rebecca Gross, she had been with this, she was one of our largest advocates, which is important. She said, every one of our students said that it was one of the best classes they had ever taken in high school because it was hands-on. There was never a chance to get bored because there was always something that to work on and learn. They loved the personal attention from the facilitators and the community experts. They also loved how useful in the real world it was, and they appreciated the practical tools they got, like sewing kits, computer fixing kits, and the toolkits. So thank you so much for allowing us to present today. Um, we are in the process of making the materials available and packaged to share with you all, but we don't have them quite ready yet. So if you have any questions um, or want to talk to us about it, you can email us or ask during the next at the end of this session. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Linda and Bonnie. So exciting. Um, I um, really, really uh, respect what you all have accomplished and um, the engagement of the the depth of engagement with the community, both in terms of drawing on the local nonprofits and drawing on the the volunteers from the repair cafes, it was really an impressive um, bringing together of all those resources to present something that was just um, really powerful. And we, I look forward to um, seeing your uh, the material that you'll make available 
and then making, um, you know, sort of deploying out into the world. So super, congratulations and thank you. Um, moving to our second uh, presenter, the student repair workshop was developed by Walter Krauss. And let me just say in advance, um, my German is non-existent and I, um, I regret my pronunciation of all your names and I hope that you will reintroduce yourselves um, properly. Um, the, uh, the student repair workshop was designed by Walter Krauss at the Rudolf Steiner School in Munich. Um, it's a regular year round class um, taught uh, through the year, um, through the regular class day, um, combining uh, hands on, technical hands on learning um, integrated into uh, a, a, a broad understanding of all the um, various aspects of our lives from the environment, social studies. Um, even citizenship, a sense of uh, values relative to oneself and the community. Um, we have um, Felix Lawson, who one of the teachers, he teaches math and is involved. There he is, waving, great, thank you. Um, and then we also have uh, two students. We have uh, Biat Schneider, Schneiderhan, you can help me with that, thank you. Um, and Carl Mo. Um, who is there. Great, super, thank you so much. Um, and then also speaking, um, so one of the fantastic things about this extraordinary program is that a few years ago, they put together um, a um, guidebook for how others can um, um, create their own student repair workshop and fresh off the press, um, it's been translated into English. So this is a fantastic resource and Claudia Muntz will uh, speak about that. Here you are, great Claudia. So I will hand it over to you all. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to introduce us? Yeah, so hello, we are Fixing for Future from Munich, Germany, uh, streaming today from FixFest in Brussel. The student repair shop is a lesson in the Budersteiner Schule in Schwabe from grade seven to grade 11. So it's around the age of 13, 14 to around 17, 18 years. And it's uh, up to two in the higher classes, even four lessons per week. And it's, so students have the possibility to learn how to uh, repair broken, devices and everyone can bring his or her um, old or broken device to the student repair shop and we start to repair it in our lessons in our school lessons um, and the main idea is just to learn by yourself learning by doing how to repair devices we also have the ability, if it really doesn't work, to look in the internet. Um, or if it still don't work, um, to ask um, some teachers or volunteers uh, being in the classroom and they say, okay, maybe try this or try that, try it this way, try it that way. Um, so this will help. And so we are responsible for the like devices of the, you can say clients. So, because they bring their broken device to us and we learn to repair it. And for me, there are two reasons why repair, coffee repair shop in schools are so important. So for the first reason is of course the environmentalism aspect. And the second is also you really learn something in school that you really, really need for your whole life and every day's life. And you can really take something out of this class what you will need um, your whole life. Um, to uh, get everyone to have this experience at their own school, we set up this uh, guidebook, um, Fixing Things for the Future, um, which is now newly translated into English, uh, as uh, you already said. And the guidebook mainly has three parts. The first part is about our experience and 
about the philosophy of repairing things, how you do it, uh, as Bert said, it's mostly experiential and discovery learning. So you learn from the process and don't get uh, much instructions from uh, teachers or experts. And then um, we have uh, kind of a, a set of a list, what you need, uh, what tools you need, how much uh, space you need for all the students at your student repair shop. Um, and the best way to set one up. And then you also have um, real, um, real good um, instructions just on, yeah, the, the most important uh, uh, parts like uh, which pliers to get, uh, which, uh, yeah, am I missing something? No, I am not really. Right? I don't think. Yeah. So maybe Claudia, you know. Yeah, uh, I will show you this book. You see, you can see it. Not so good, but a little bit, and it's available uh, quite freshly, as you told already. Um, and I want to say, uh, we did the. We did not. We we asked a, a, a man to do the translation, uh, and the initiative for this came from Vita, and this is why we all want to say very very much thank you for this initiative, because um, this gives us the opportunity not to to not only to um, to give this book to the German speaking countries. <clears throat> but also to the English speaking world. And um, maybe you three, Felix, uh, Karl, and uh, Beat, maybe you want to, to uh, talk a little bit about what happened this morning in Brussels. When you offered these things, what are your impressions? I mean, like, um, I'm not quite sure if everyone is aware. What is happening here? We have perhaps 100 people or 150 people. Um, and um, here are a lot of courses where you can hear different experiences, kind of like here. And um, we took the, the books with us and showed them to everyone. And I think they are, most of the people are very interested, of course. And I mean, I'm not quite sure if I can tell or should tell any more things about it because the basic is um, how to set up a uh, yeah, cafe at a school. I mean, like that's, that's the thing. We also have with us the, the mindset um, book. It's about, or it's even more basic. Um, it starts with, not with repairing itself, but rather with um, making curious about repairing and um, also trying to, to teach the skills or to trigger the skills which are useful for repairing and to, to open the mind for repairing, um, which can also be used in uh, classes with younger students and uh, in every class like French, German, English, math, uh, with little tasks. And um, the, the good thing is, I, I think it's already, uh, it has already been said, but you can also download it for free. It's all online. Um, and I think that's enough information because, yeah. So I would like to add that there was a very huge interest in this book or in this project at all, because when you're looking at repairing community, there are often more older people, I I would say, or it isn't where in this teenage generation or in the younger generations. And this is what makes our project so special. And it also shows that there is a huge interest in bringing repairing, repair culture to schools because in my eyes, schools are the 
are one of the most important places for learning how to repair because we can found the confidence in the students to just say, okay, I have a broken device. I want to repair it by myself and not just throw it away. And I think this is very important. And what we are hoping for is just like starting a movement or bringing this culture of repair to even more schools. And in my eyes, every school should have this uh, lessons of learning how to repair devices because it is, like I already said, very important. And just to answer at the question, no, we are, there are very few, but it's, yeah, it's like I already said, it's something very special. And we hope to like bring in the idea to more schools so that uh, even more schools uh, will um, take the repair culture in their timetable for students. But it is difficult. Um, yeah, but we are, we are, we keep fighting. That's that's great. And perhaps that's a Claudia. Did you have something more you wanted to say? No, just just one one half sentence uh, because they did it wonderful uh, to yeah. talk about the book. Uh, what is important to us is to say. This book is not meant, meant as a recipe or a cookbook. It is meant as an impulse or a, a inspiration for others who are interested to do anything in this way and to do it in their way. So we give some examples. We have six years of experience with this form, but this is not the only right form. This is our form. And uh, we want to inspire uh, everybody else uh, to find their own form. Great, thank you all so much. This is just super exciting. Um, I do wanna qualify one thing you said, Claudia, I think you gave me a little too much credit. Um, I would say that the only thing that I did was download the German version, send it through Google Translate and say to myself, wow, the English speaking people of the world need to have access to this. Um, so I'll take credit for that. And um, you all are just phenomenal. So thank you so much. And as Phil said, um, it is available right now for download. Um, I have uh, links on the culture repair website where you can do that, um, as well as our one of our future, the, the fourth presenter, um, and uh, very shortly, those links for download will be available um, on the school's website. Um, so, and as was said, it's fresh off the press and we'll have hard copies available very soon already in Brussels. So thank yes. you all so much. Peter, one more one, thing. One second, please. Because Walter Kraus, the, the founder the, and the, the spiritual vector of the student repair shop, he is here but we cannot see him and we cannot hear him. Ah, Jetta, hello. <laughs> now it's working. Great, thanks to my, uh, to, to Carl and, and Bert, very good, explained <laughs> uh, the, the workshop, also the lesson in, in school. So we will, um, I'm so glad you could come online so we could thank you virtually in person and um, celebrate what you've accomplished and, uh, and thank you. Um, thank you all so much. Um, you, you've done a great job of presenting a really strong, powerful program. And I, I like uh, Beat's finishing words. We will, um, uh, nothing more important than fighting for installing repair workshops in schools everywhere. So um, our thanks. Um, okay. So I'm going to move on. Um, uh, we, we're starting to run short on time. So uh, Charles uh, Eichem um, is the uh, founder and executive director of Policy Lab Africa. Um, he's established a vocational class for girls in hardware repair. All right, thank you very much, you guys. Um, thank you for the intro, Vita. I wanted to share with you guys our program here in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, 
we are running a gifted hands uh, training program in Lagos, Nigeria um, from Policy Lab Africa. I wanted to share a little bit of background about our program. Um, I mean, sometime after the COVID, um, so we were trying to collect data to open source the data for, for locating, um, you know, repair businesses and shops. Um, so people can also take their stuff there without having um, much of physical contact within the um, repair market um, that is usually seen in, in Lagos, Nigeria. So um, after we mapped about 5,500 repair businesses um, within the city, um, I mean, we did it physically. So we didn't see any woman captured in the data. There was no woman that was a repairer within the data base. And uh, I mean, this was coming at a time where we are trying to kind of uh, bring initiatives to be able to kind of empower, um, you know, more repairers and give them more knowledge to be able to fix uh, different kinds of devices. And that kind of, uh, you know, stuck to us that, um, that, uh, you know, coming up with an idea of uh, repair training, you know, for, for young girls will be an important addition to our right to repair, you know, movement. I think that one thing that is also important is that, you know, we believe that, you know, building, you know, sustainable and inclusive features, a lot of things are kind of eluded in terms of, um, you know, the economic gap, you know, between, you know, the different classes, you know, of people. And I think that repair is one way that we can kind of bring everybody into kind of, you know, the digital economy, you know, in some way. So we wanted to be able to capture that, to be able to give people the skills as well as the opportunity to be able to earn money. And that led us to, to be able to start a program, a free training program for girls alone. So a training program designed for girls to venture into the repair and maintenance industry in, in Nigeria. So our vision is to um, you know, empower more Nigerian girls to learn and earn. We are looking at the, uh, both the economic, um, the social and the, and the environmental uh, you know, aspect of kind of uh, you know, raising um, you know, girls that are kind of you know, aware of, of repair and can be advocates you know, of repair in the long run. So our, our goals, um, so we want to train young girls in, you know, professional, you know, phone repair. Um, I mean, in our capacity, it, that is what we kind of uh, thought about. Um, we wanted to also kind of help them to improve their employment and, their, you know, entrepreneurial aspects so they can earn some money at the, at the, at the long run. I, I think that... Um, in terms of reducing you know, inequities, I think that uh, the data was so you know, glaring you know, for us you know, that no woman was kind of uh, available to take up this um, you know, job you know, within the industry. So we want to be able to kind of reduce those kind of inequities you know, within the, that sector. Um, yeah, we want to also you know, dismantle stereotypes. We feel that uh, there are jobs that are meant for men, there are jobs that are meant for women, you know, but in the digital age, as we have seen, anybody can be anything really. If you go on YouTube, you can learn a skill and you rock it. So that is what we also want to be able to promote, you know, young girls that could be proud, you know, technicians and fix, you know, stuff for a living. So in doing that, we kind of started to research. Um, we went to the restart. Um, you know, websites, we went to culture of repair, we went to iFixit, we tried to put together, you know, a curriculum that could be able to address a lot of the, you know, repair as we have seen in our own market. So we designed this curriculum, an eight week intensive, you know, program, you know, that involves, uh, you know, introduction to, you know, mobile phone and GSM engineering. Um, we have practical repairs, you know, looking at the OS of the phone. Um, we have things like uh, fittings, accessories, and uh, you know replacements. You know re how to reheat and change uh, the chips. Um, we also have assembling different types of mobile phone, unlocking, um, you know, repairing the IMEI, you know, through online operations such as uh, you know unlocking through software. And then at the end of this eight-week intensive course, 
um, each student will come up with a capstone project. So you have we have different uh, you know spare parts of phones. So you could be able to kind of assemble them, fit them together. And we have um, we are kind of uh, in partnership with iFixit. So you kind of upload whatever you worked on on the you know iFixit repair guide. So each student will create a profile there throughout their eight weeks. Anything you repair, you kind of upload it there. So that becomes an avenue for us to kind of uh, ex, um, you know kind of evaluate their 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 um, their ability and uh, what they've learned so far. And then we have. Uh, the final test and the certification. Um, we give them a certificate and that helps them to maybe if they want to find a job, um, they can. But uh, apart from all this, we also kind of give them, um, a, you know, a practical, you know, business, um, you know, class where we teach them how to kind of price, you know, your repair and how to kind of set up, have an online presence if you want to be um, an independent technician. Um, we have given uh, about 80% of our um, students opportunities um, to go to um, further their internships. So we partner with local repair shops where we kind of uh, attach them to kind of learn apprenticeship for, for another, another three months to be able to deepen you know, their knowledge of repairing different varieties of, of devices. Um, also, a large percentage of them has set up their own, um, you know, businesses, you know, fixing things, you know, from their, from their, from their homes, and uh, and putting themselves, you know, out there to be able to kind of uh, for people to kind of reach them, to to fix something for them. We are also running a community repair workshop. The community repair workshop is uh, we choose a day in a month. We go into a particular community and we fix their stuff for free. And that helps them to be able to learn quickly on the spot as they go through these eight weeks of intensive um, you know, classes. So this is a, you know, a snapshot. I think this should be like the second week of, uh, of the classes uh, you know, with, the, with the girls. And, uh, um, you know, learning to use multimeter and uh, for the first time and stuff like that, see how to read, um, you know, those circuits. Um, so yeah, um, for for us, our 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 program is is educative, but you know, but the intention is to be able to empower people to make a living, you know, out of it. So it's more like on the spot. It's quite kind of uh, you know different from other programs that that we have seen. Um, so we want to make sure that they get, you know, the right, you know, market-driven um, skills that will be able to get them jobs at the end of these eight weeks. Um, many of them have gone on to, you know, get jobs. Um, some of them, majority of them, are kind of staying on their own and, uh, you know, fixing phones and uh, and laptops and and stuff like that, and also kind of continuing to learn more. About, about repairing the process. I mean, we have built um, an army of uh, you know, repair advocates. Um, and I think that was our, one of our intentions to be able to have more voices, you know, to be able to kind of uh, you know, come on and join us in this fight for, 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 for right to repair in, in Nigeria. Um, yeah, I think that uh, our program is, uh, is kind of uh, still developing um, this year. Um, we've already trained about 90 girls, and the next year we have a target to train about 200. Um, we have a lot of uh, partnership and uh, conversations with different uh, international NGOs that want to be able to kind of expand this program to different parts of the country. I think like if you understand, uh, you know, Nigeria, how big and diverse it is, and uh, and the, and the economic uh, you know situation. I think that this uh, is a program that kind of sets everything apart. So it's a, a very good pathway for for international NGOs that are kind of looking that kind of looking at you know um, having an innovative or creative program to to empower people. You know that is not the 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 norm. And you, you know usually we have you know train girls on how to make hair or how to make dresses. You know, but this is kind of a little bit different and more daring. And so many of them are kind of keen into it. Um, 
2023, we want to be able to go, um, you know, full scale, um, train more people. We now have two locations where we train people with about 40, 40 per class. Um, next year, we want to be able to kind of uh, double that and also kind of have um, a solid um, online resources, you know, where um, our trainees will continue to use as a reference, you know, in their everyday kind of, uh, you know, business or learning. And, and that is our target. Um, uh, we are looking forward to your suggestions, your inputs or questions, and uh, thank you very much for, for, for listening. Thank you, Charles. That you're just doing a, an amazing job. This is it feels like it's on the on the the cutting edge in terms of um, addressing um, social issues. That is the inequity with women and facilitating um, their being able to get out and um, and not just uh, provide for their families and themselves, but to really become models for other girls coming up. So thank you. And let me mention that your um, curriculum, um, there's a link also on the Culture of Repair website um, to, um, to what you uh, have done. And we appreciate your making it available um, as well. Um, so thank you, Charles. Um, so turning now, uh, our, our fourth presenter is uh, Agency by Design Oakland, um, Brooke Toslowski is uh, the, the, a co-founder and co-executive director um, uh, of uh, Agency by Design Oakland. Um, Paula Mitchell, who's the current executive um, director is unfortunately unable to join us this morning. She's attending to Family Matters. Um, uh, but Brooke was uh, uh, deeply, well, she led the, the team that developed the, the Cultivating a Repair Mindset Toolkit and um, so I'll let her um, tell you something about um, that initiative and, um, and the product, the, the guide that was developed out of that. So Brooke, please. Thank you so much, Vita. Good morning, everyone. Well, good morning here. I'm on the East Coast of the United States. As Vita said, I was the co-founder of Agency by Design Oakland and the former co-director. Um, Oakland, of course, uh, is in California, right next to um, Transition Berkeley's program and where Vita is located. Um, it's been wonderful to hear about all these different programs in different locations. Um, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start with a couple of stories this morning. Starting with this one, and this is coming straight from the Repair Mindset Toolkit. Back to school. At an annual back to school night in a classroom packed to the brim with parents and caregivers, a classroom teacher shares an overview of the upcoming year's curriculum, aspirations, and expectations. As a brief aside, the teacher asks, does anyone know how to fix a portable CD player? Mine isn't working properly. The immediate and nearly unanimous response from the seated parents resounds, just buy a new one. That was that end of our first story compared to a student Gloria in a classroom at Grass Valley Elementary School in Oakland. Gloria is, is taking part in an activity where um, students are taking objects apart. Gloria spots amidst the pile of objects, a Chromebook that won't close all the way. Returning to her partner with the computer, they both start to explore. Gloria uses a nearby screwdriver to remove over half the screws from the backside of the computer. The teacher, excited by Gloria's initiative, asks the pair what they think is wrong with the Chromebook. Gloria shares that she notices how one plastic piece in the back of the now open computer sticks up differently than a similar piece on the other side. Before the teacher can respond to this observation, Gloria takes the back of the screwdriver and pushes the plastic piece back into place. Sure enough, when the students screw the backside cover back onto the computer and now closes without a problem. She doesn't say it, but what's really happening here with Gloria is the sense of maybe I can fix it. At Agency by Design Oakland and our work grew out of a research project called Agency by Design at Project Zero at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, we're really curious about mindset. So we, along with our partners, Maker Ed and the Culture of Repair Project, we asked this question. What characterizes a repair mindset and how do we cultivate it? 
The work of Agency by Design in this research project at Project Zero was really based on um, something called the triadic theory of dispositions, which says that you have to have three things to have a disposition. You have to have the inclination, you have to want to do something, you have to have the tools to do it and the knowledge of how to do it, like how to fix the computer, how to fix the bike, how to use the tools. But you also have, need to have something called sensitivity, which is you have to notice when to do it and that there's an invitation or opportunity to make something or fix something. When I first started thinking about repair and in our little working group, which I'll tell you about in a second, we did kind of a scavenger hunt, if you will, of looking for things in our home that needed repair. And I literally had never noticed it before. It was not something that was even apparent to me. I did not have a mindset of repair, even though I have lots of skills, technical skills. I'm an artist and I know how to fix things, but I didn't even notice that there was the opportunity to do it. And in our work in agency by design, we've really focused on sensitivity and in specifically in schools, because unfortunately in schools, we design out full, we design sensitivity out of schools. So we basically say, okay, go ahead and solve this problem with the Pythagorean theorem. Go ahead and do this with this. We don't say you figure it out, right? Um, so anyways, I recommend checking out agencybydesign.org. It's great in this book, great resources here. And um, a lot of the educators in our network have case studies in this book. So this tool that was mentioned earlier is for free download. Um, it's a toolkit, Cultivating a Repair Mindset um, in the K-12 setting and beyond. I've used the tools in here with my kids at home during distance learning. It's great for adults. You can download it on the Culture of Repair Projects website as well as on Maker Ed's website. And this was really put together of a working group of educators Na Nguyen, um, a technology, art, design, math, and Japanese teacher in Alameda, uh, myself, Susan Wolf, an arts integration specialist and professional artist, Paula Mitchell, the current executive director of Agency by Design Oakland, Reina Cabezas, a sustainable science, uh, science teacher in the Sustainable Urban Design Academy in Oakland, and Aaron Vanderwerf, the former education director at Maker Ed, and Vita was also an important part of our working group. The richness of repair as we started to dig into it was just so, we, we immediately started seeing connections for English teachers, for math teachers, for really all uh, educators. There's an opportunity here to ask students rich, deep um, questions and for them to explore for themselves, what does repair mean? And of course, uh, we're, we're focusing here on objects in this toolkit because they are realia. They are a great place to start to get your hands on, but this is a door for us to open up and think about systems. We don't want just students. Um, for us, we're really interested in students being able to fix objects in the world around them, but also systems. Um, we have a lot of healing that needs to happen in that regard. And so in the toolkit, there are things like this where we dig deep into some of the theory and pedagogy that we explored in our research project around repair. And then we also have tools. So this is laying out what I was mentioning before, the inclination, sensitivities, and abilities, getting kind of into the nitty gritty of what does the disposition to care for and repair for objects look like. Um, and once you kind of know and name those things as educators, you can just start to design for them to help cultivate them. They become sort of your objectives in the classroom, right? And so here's an example of some of the tools. Um, this is a zine, very simple, great tool designed by Susan Wolf in our working group. You download it. There's ex explanations on how to fold it. It's also known as like a poncho book. If you're a bookmaker, you fold it and there's one little cut and it's called how to get curious about repair. Really simple things. What is repair? Why repair? Go on a repair hunt. Think about what tools you need. So it's really kind of a beginning invitation um, and can be used at all different levels age-wise. Age Here's another example of a tool, an exploration. Um, something you know that a teacher can easily in any classroom print out eight and a half by 11, have some objects available. And now, okay, let's explore. You know, maybe have a notebook, you know, 
a repair notebook to your side. What are the materials this object is made from? Um, how might you explore it? Pick it up, shake it, listen to it, open it up. Um, what's on the inside? Just lots of really open-ended questions. Um, lots of ways to explore um, and document through language. If you're working with English language learners, this is a great invitation to start thinking about verbs and names of materials and start teaching English as well. And then here, lastly, is another example. There's more tools in the toolkit. Um, this one follows the same form that a thinking routine. Project Zero is very well known for their thinking routines. And they also have one called Parts Perspectives Me, and this is based on that. Um, this is getting a little bit more into the systems and complexity side of things. So first, of course, thinking about the parts of an object, illustrating it, maybe diagramming it, but then considering taking, doing a little perspective taking. You know, perhaps somebody else might look at this same object and not think it's broken. They might look at um, a doll with its, you know, its head is missing and you think, oh, how am I going to fix this head? And someone else might think, actually, this is now a piece of art. This is perfect. Um, or thinking about the perspective of someone who made this object. You know, what were their intentions? As we all know, as we're, you know, in this whole conference thinking about right to repair, some designers are, of course, making objects um, with obsolescence in mind. They don't want you to repair it. And so considering those perspectives. And lastly, as we were digging into repair, we noticed a lot of delicious stories were coming up when we would find something in our own homes. And we had a lot we wanted to say about this object that was so meaningful to us. And so thinking about how you're involved and how you're connected to this object. So um, I'll pause there and I know we have another presenter um, and I'm happy to answer questions later on. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Brooke. Um, it's just a fantastic project and um, a really valuable resource that uh, you all have put out into the world and really, really appreciate it. Um, I'll mention again that it's available um, on the Culture of Repair website for immediate download. And we have um, uh, printed copies on the way, it will be available in a few days. And you can on the Culture Repair website indicate your interest if you'd like to know about when they're available and um, we'll provide some details just in a few days. Um, so let me then move to Jan uh, Janina and please help me pronounce your name. I realized this morning that uh, it's probably I'm not pronouncing correctly. Um, Janina Klos at the Technical University of Berlin. Um, she's interested in technology and the environment and entrepreneurship. Um, she's currently investigating implementation in, uh, models of repair in educational settings. And so I super uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. And I was intrigued uh, even before I, I was aware of you, I had come across um, again, pronunciation, the Kare So project, um, care and repair, promoting the care of objects as a new form of taking responsibility and global solidarity. So I said to myself, mm, I want to hear from this woman. So please. Thank you so much, Vita. Um, my name is Janina Klose. <laughs> And I live with my family in the heart of Berlin. And um, the question was raised earlier, if there are more repair projects in Germany, and yes, they are. Uh, all these um, locations um, throughout Berlin, like schools, where um, educators actively repair with students um, that I talk to are mapped here. And I've been to more places uh, throughout Germany where teachers or other educators actively repair with uh, pupils. Um, so we have many, but they are very different. And like we already heard today, um, there are many different approaches on how to repair. And that's exactly uh, what I'm researching. I'm using grounded theory and participatory action research which means um, not all but uh, some of the educators uh, work with me and uh, reflect on their teaching um, practice understand and improve up on them and the situations in which they find themselves um, 
So I try to understand how to um, improve and how to build a better repair education. And um, one of the things that um, I ask uh, everybody is why they do um, repairing. And I brought one of the many, many reasons um, to you now. Uh, now. And uh, it's a teacher who said, in order to spread the sort of uh, sustainability, in order to sensitize the pupils, they don't have to throw everything away all the time, that it's not cool. And simply in order to give, have them develop a different relation to objects. And this is going into this care and repair view um, that we in my project um, um, emphasize on repair, but uh, it's not the only one that I will focus on in this um, presentations, though, um, uh, because to get to this point of reflection that is definitely important uh, for education, for repair, um, it is very helpful for the students to get into um, practical repairing first. And uh, I will <laughs> show to you what else is there um, to learn about repairing really quickly using this comic, but we already heard a lot, so just very fast. Um, uh, it says, dear various parents, grandparents, coworkers, and other non-computed people, we don't magically know how to do everything in every program. And when we help you, uh, so when we use the social competence that we help others, um, we're usually doing this. We are at a first uh, competence and then find a menu item or button which locates uh, which looks relevant to what you want to do. So we need a technical knowledge of how things work and uh, how our problem is structured. Uh, we can click it, which in other problems, not software problems would be, I have to sue it, I have to solder it, I have to um, um, screw it. Uh, I need a method methodical competence in order to do this. And uh, if this doesn't work, I need to uh, pick one at random. I have to try something out. I need a, a self-competence there I, um, because there is a lot of anxiety with just trying out things. And if this still doesn't work, I need a methodical competence of research. I Google the problem with a few words related to what I want to no, and um, that's also something that really needs to be addressed because when I want to repair something at home, I don't necessarily have somebody to ask right around the corner. Um, and if this still didn't work, I really have to need the self-competence to um, uh, overcome frustration to uh, go on working on this. And I need a self-competence also to decide when I'm not going to continue working on this because uh, here it says, have you been doing this over half an hour? Ask somebody for help or give up. And um, in order to decide uh, when to do those things, I need, uh, again, self-competences. And for asking for help, I need a social competence. Um, so there are uh, really many overlaying factors that would lead for me to have a success to um, for me to have a successful repair um, story, but also many learning opportunities uh, during repair. And there's one more thing I want to emphasize on. Um, when er, the Club of Rome in 1972 uh, published the limits of growth, um, they already knew we would uh, reach the point where we have to think about our resources, but now they worry also about something else. And um, they just published this year a new analysis uh, about the situation of the world, and they are looking at important measures that have to be um, taken now in order to establish a future worth of living for humanity. And one important factor that they see is that uh, education needs to teach critical thinking and complex system thinking for girls and boys. Um, because, and I quote, the most significant challenge of our day is not climate change, 
biodiversity loss or pandemics, the most significant problems are our collective inability to distinguish between fact and fiction. And um, of course, one of the things that uh, drive this problem is social media. Um, but uh, another aspect is that we don't understand the objects we use in our daily life anymore. And um, repair can ground us in the sense that uh, we uh, feel like we understand the world around us and um, there are actually facts um, that we can be sure about. It's not magic that drives our computer. And uh, if there is a hidden microphone in it, I will be able to find out about it. And uh, the problem that we face now is we want to teach repair. How do we do it? It's really challenging. Like there are uh, problems we also have with other topics, like um, it might be difficult to motivate pupils to participate because we already know repairing is cool, but they don't. Uh, we need to think a lot about safety. Maybe that's a German problem. I don't know, but in Germany, we often don't have wireless internet in schools, which is really helpful for repairing. Uh, but the most important thing I see is the agency of repair objects that is more significant than um, the agency of other objects uh, we use in our education um, usually. Let me emphasize on this. Um, there is a project in Germany called uh, Reti BNE, and um, they published a lot of resources about how to uh, repair in a classroom during technical education. And um, as I talked to many educators who are Germany, most of them knew about the project and that there were materials and none of them used them. Um, so the question standing in the room is, uh, why don't you? And the thing is that, um, for example, um, there is a material about a uh, broken Nintendo controller. And of course, I can plan my um, classroom setting about repairing a Nintendo controller, but I will, if I want to do it uh, in another town with another class, have to search for a Nintendo controller to do exactly the same thing. And then the Nintendo controller needs to have the same default, which I do not know until I actually open it. Um, so it's very difficult to have um, materials about how to uh, do repair in a classroom that uh, also work in another kind of uh, situation. And uh, I figured out that there are three different uh, teaching approaches that deal with this problem. So uh, there is an educator oriented kind of way. And those educators try to stick with this um, systematic knowledge transfer and with instructing, uh, but they're limiting the uh, objects that are repaired to the objects uh, that they can um gather in a, a big amount and uh, where they are sure that they will know how to fix them and there are other ex um, uh, teaching approaches that go with the unforeseeable uh, factor of the repair object and say okay so we need to be flexible and um, um the pupil oriented um method uh, stays instructing and they say okay we limit the amount of pupils we just take few people's pupils in uh, so we can really tend to their needs and um, we can teach them um, how to repair their own objects um, but we just cannot deal with so many problems at a time and another way to do it is to decide okay as a teacher, I have to tell you, dear students, I do not know how to repair those things. And we have to find out together. And uh, this is just a space where you uh, can find out. And um, this is what I call the socio-integrative oriented teaching approach. And let's look into this. What does this mean into practice? When you uh, teach educator oriented, 
We have the special strength that people can develop high technical and methodical competences for the object that you have, but there are limited uh, repair objects that you can um, actually repair in the setting because when you're um, thinking about laptops, for example, every laptop is very, very different and um, you cannot know how to open and repair every laptop uh, or every kind of laptop ahead. I uh, give you an example how this is done. Um, two student assistants uh, here in Berlin are teaching change really challenging fifth graders. I met them, but they're really cool. And uh, they didn't get a room, they didn't get any tools, they got 500 euros and uh, some old bicycles. And they made a plan like, what do pupils need to know? We need to name the bicycle. They made a curriculum and they do one repair at a time and it's really good and uh, the kids love them. Great project. There is a pupil oriented uh, way where you um, have the special strengths that you can move on with the strong motivations of the pupils to be successful because they want to repair their own things. And because you um, do not uh, have many pupils at a time, um, you can com uh, address complex matters through this appear repair. And uh, you have uh, fast success results because you tend to it a lot. And um, this is the closest it gets to a repair cafe. And um, the difference to a repair cafe is that um, in repair cafes, it happens often that um, uh, volunteers focus more on the object than on the person who brought in the object. So uh, the goal is to have the object repaired. And here we emphasize more on educating the pupil of what they need to do um, in order to fix something themselves. And um, now we have the uh, example I will skip because of time. And socio-integrative oriented has a special strength of um, aiming for high autonomy for at home repairs. And um, the challenge that the teacher needs to deal with a situation in which they don't know the right solution for things. Also, they need a budget for um, um, spare parts and uh, tools, those kind of things. And they need um, internet access and devices for internet access. Um, one example is a um teacher who works with 10 pupils at a time he split his classroom and um they're in an eighth grade compulsory elective subject and um the group stay on a repair for six to eight lessons in a row that means three to four months actually for one repair and um they um are not instructed, they research themselves how to repair, how to buy tools, uh, what they need, um, how to get the spare parts, which I think sometimes is the most um, uh, challenging thing, um, how to repair, and they also document their repairs. And you can see an example of the, how they document and repair um, in this picture because um, this uh, is really important when you want to stay on the repair project for a long time, because next time you come in, you might not know anymore uh, what you've done last time. And um, problem is that when pupils are forced into this project, um, they are forced to work um, very independently and independently, and this doesn't um, work without motivation sort of thing. <laughs> and um, what uh, was experienced to help us is get expert volunteers into the project um, who uh, can tell about their um, relation to repair and um, uh, this like social um, interaction um, is really promoting the repair very well. Another example is 
um, a teacher who's really going all in in um, Oldenburg. He also had support by a local university. And um, they are working with 25 students at a time, eighth and ninth grade. And students stick with this project for two years. And um, every second week, they offer people who live close by that they repair uh, objects for them. And um, obviously, because people don't always know uh, right away like what to do, um, they are also um volunteers there that help them and um younger students uh, in the first year are helped by older students in the second year and um they don't only um research themselves about repairs and do themselves the repairs but they also organize um uh, like greeting the customers and they organize um, uh, the tools that have to be brought to this event and um, like printing and designing flyers and everything that has to be done around this kind of repair cafe event. Uh, problem is that you need to prepare for occasional failure if you really let uh, students do many things by themselves. And uh, the teacher really works over time in order to facilitate this. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Wow. Wow, Janina, thank you so much. This is um, um, this is so awesome. I uh, I I'm feel I feel a little bit like a child. I'm so excited. I can hardly stand it. <laughs> um, so I thank you for this. Um, for your offering. Um, so we're we're pretty short on time, um, but there, there were um, some fantastic questions that came across. And so let me ask Kyle if she can, um, uh, has maybe a, the one critical theme that came up over and over again um, and see if there are, our, our presenters can address that. So Kyle, are yeah, you on thank you. Lita. Can you hear me? Yes. No okay, video. Wonderful. No video yet. Um, I think I'll. I just have a quick question that I want to offer for the presenters to share to close out. Um, you all talked about challenges to accessing repair or the right to do it, and um, I would love to hear what is one thing that people can do to get going. Um, as people are engaging in this practice. And I'll type my question in the chat. Um, you can feel free to answer in popcorn style, but just as we close out, what's one thing that people can do? So did you all, uh, did you all get that? Um, so I'd like to hear from each of the programs, whether there was one critical thing that they um, found um, key to moving from, you know, we know there's lots of challenges. And so what was one thing that really opened the door for establishing your repair um, programs? And uh, any volunteers for first up? Well, I'll jump in. I do think that in our repair mindset toolkit, I think the tools in here are very um, basic and beginning level that these are very introductory opportunities just to start asking the question, what even is repair? Why should I repair something? What around me needs repair? So um, just wanted to offer that up. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Let's see, I have raised hands from uh, Bonnie. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think building a community and getting like the teachers um repair people on board and just really that that's so important to have have that in place especially the teachers here <laughs> if you want to teach um yeah teach the students great thank you thank you bonnie um my screen indicates i have someone else um who wants to say something I, I'd um, like to, I'll, can I, if I can uh, just echo what Bonnie, can you hear me? Yes. I, I just like to echo what Bonnie said. Um, it's really relationship building 
And for us, um, Vita was so, you were so instrumental in helping us start repair cafes in the community. So then we had, we have like 40 <laughs> people to draw from that can help us with the work in the classroom, as well as um, nonprofit groups in our community. Um, and then as Bonnie would said, like we actually had one particular teacher at Berkeley High that um, I happen to know personally, and she was the one that kept saying, let's have a repair cafe here. And then she was our main contact in developing the class. So um, relationships, really, really important. Um, you know, I, uh, it sounds like relationships for opening the door and then resources coming from behind to actually step through effectively. And I wonder, Claudia, would you mind, it sounds something similar, and I bet that Walter was your key person in helping open the door, and it sounds like you all, too, draw quite a bit on community. Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> it is, I don't know if only in Germany, very, very complicated to, uh, to find schools who are ready to establish, uh, for example, a student repair shop, because the school uh, directors often, the first sentence they say is, what else shall we do? We have a lot, we have no time, we have too many, uh, too, too less people and so on and so on, and they make like this. What we found out what works very well is if you find interested uh, parents, who say this would be very, very good if our children would learn this at school, repairing. And now my problem is I don't know the English word for housemeister. <laughs> Anina, was weißt du das? Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're looking uh, a person who works at school for maintenance, like yeah. he is making oh. sure there is light and he's putting oil in the doors if there's creaking, yeah. um, this kind of stuff. You, you know what we mean? Yes. Which person? So this is a key person, as we found out. If this person says, oh, yes, that's very interesting because uh, it's close to my profession. It's close to my to my um, what I'm doing every day. And I promote this in, in the school. They are the, the, the hidden authorities <laughs> at school. And if one teacher and one parent gets together with this person, they uh, have a very good chance to, to move the school. Wow, thank you. Um, the theme I'm hearing um, between you and Transition Berkeley is to have a champion in the school and, and not in sort of an, an enthusiasm um, from without that you, that you can bring to that champion. Yeah. Um, it also sounds like that, uh, and this addresses directly fixing for the future, that, that if the teachers have to invent something from scratch, it's very, very difficult uh, to just put together everything that you need in order to get together. So if you have material that you can draw on and you have the enthusiasm and the support from outside and you have a champion inside, it sounds like that's sort of the secret sauce um, that that's the sort of, uh, um, the the most promising circumstances for actually getting a, a project off the ground. Yeah, and uh, you have to do networking <laughs> for funding and for finding mm -hmm. uh, volunteers to for support and so on. It's uh, not an easy thing, but if you if you get along. Uh, Everybody who is involved loves it very much. And in the case of fixing for the future, there's a special um, thing that motiv motivates the students. That is, they do not prepare things of their own, but of external customers. Mm -hmm. Every time the, the, the student repair shop is open, people can come. Nobody knows what they will bring. They come, the students do all the contact with the customers on their own, and they know they, are res they take uh, responsibility for the object the customers bring and for 
at least trying to repair the broken objects. This is so a very great motivation. So it sounds like some relevance and some sense of responsibility, yeah. Yeah. Um, relevance of the activity and responsibility um, to their community. Janina, yeah. did you have something? It looked like you were raising your hand. Uh, yeah, um, I wanted to emphasize on you need funding because you do. <laughs> uh, you need money to buy uh, tools and spare parts and maybe uh, devices for access uh, the internet. And um, it's also really helpful. Like I, I showed you how many projects there are in Berlin. This is because we have a local foundation um, who gives out annual money to projects who actively repair with pupils. Uh, that includes um, money for an expert volunteer. Like it's only like 400 euros a month. So it's not much. Uh, it's not like a job, but um, it uh, does enable projects to feel like, okay, I have something to offer. And this is like a basis from where I can start. Gives teachers also um, uh, the possibility to connect and to feel valued uh, with their work. Um, and you like you can really see how much impact this has in uh, Berlin, but it's not guaranteed that the project will stay. Like, okay, first it's really difficult to build it up. And uh, um, like the setup of your school is also important for that. Like are there facilities um, that you can use where you can uh, put your stuff, where you have good light, where you have um, access to the right uh, kind of time uh, where people do want to go, uh, stuff like this. Uh, how do you have times in your schedule where you can uh, put this program? And um, you need a headmaster, headmaster that is a little bit bold, like uh, there are so many regulations on um, safety at work, especially with pupils. Um, like um, um, uh, there is an insurance, uh, I don't know if it's only in Germany, but I don't think so, um, that you can have, um, but um, still headmasters usually feel like it's quite a risk to take on. So uh, that's something you also need to address. And we have a project where the headmaster changed and the project was canceled. We have a project where the teacher changed into another role and the project was canceled. So it's uh, often really individual based, like you need this one person that drives it. And um, also with the project we had that was pupil based, like um, pupil were doing it without any teachers, like no teacher ever involved, uh, uh, but they had the headmaster and not, um, the, not the head, yeah, also the headmaster, but um, the maintenance person on their side. And um, also this project ended when the um, um, most, um, uh, I don't know, the pupil who knew the most, like he went out of school and uh, it died pretty fastly. Well, you know, and maybe we'll wrap up on this theme and it draws together the whole Fix Fest. I think that we're all witnessing, um, we are at an inflection point. Um, right to repair is something that people used to think that's a weird term. You know, I didn't know about that. And so now we're seeing legislation passed, we're seeing policies, policies put in place. And I think that we're also seeing the effect of community repair events. Um, we have, you know, repair cafes happening happening all over. And so effectively what it's doing is creating visibility and enthusiasm. We've all been to community repair events and people get so excited and they say, whoa, we should have been doing this all along. This is the right thing to do. And I think that that creates the kind of support from below and then the, the legitimacy of even, you know, uh, President Biden saying people ought to be able to fix their phones. Um, and so that there, that provides a legitimacy that gives effectively cover for, um, and, um, you know, an affirmation of the people who are interested in this. So I, I think you all are exactly right in addressing all the various challenges of both implementing and continuing forward, but I'm hopeful 
given you know, the, the shift that we're seeing in the world to the legitimization of the idea of repair, that those resources will be more forthcoming. Um, so um, so I, I wanna um, remind people that there are resources posted on the Culture of Repair website, um, both uh, the resources, the materials that are currently available, but all the names and websites of the various presenters today, as well as links to their materials. And last but not least, the, a link to the forum at the Restart Project, where we can continue this conversation um, and uh, share resources and network and, um, and take this enthusiasm for um, uh, taking repair into the educational context um, forward, the actual programs on the ground. Um, so let's see, is there anything else or shall we wrap it up there? I think we're- Thank you very much, Rita. I have one more little thing. If oh, there yes. are uh, any people listening who want to uh, join into the participatory action research I'm performing and um, um, making the project better by uh, reflecting together with me up on their practice, um, please get in contact with me. I will put my email address in this chat right now, but I will also um, post something in the homepage that you mentioned, Rita. Fantastic. I just can't thank you all enough. I can't thank, I mean, the, your panelists, all you attendees who uh, stayed to the bitter end. I um, am super excited and am really looking forward to seeing what everybody does.